This audio presentation and six lessons on the silence by James E. Dodge is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com, copyright 2013, all rights reserved. Verse, The Awakening. Come unto my soul, O Thou Almighty One. Kindle herein thy spark of love, that I may always live and be in constant companionship with thee. Let me express thee here below in any masterful way that my brother shall know that there is, ever was, and ever shall be, a power within to lift us up to master men, away from toil and pain and sin. Let this be so that others may know this higher, brighter road to go, which leads to joy, tranquility, and life celestial with thee. James Dodd Forward This is a distinctive teaching of mastery, founded by W. Frederick Keeler, with whom I had the pleasure of studying for a number of years, to whom I am deeply grateful for the many advantages this opportunity afforded me. My sole object in entering this field of endeavor is to carry forth, as best I may, the many wonderful truths set forth in this teaching. Thus entering the Master's ministry, my humble endeavor shall be to hasten the time when all men shall realize the oneness of all life and enjoy the kingdom of heaven here and now. The teaching contained in these lessons differs considerably in three distinct principles from the teaching of so-called New Thought School. 1. I do not teach affirmation in the sense as it is generally used in other schools, where it is often used as a dominating means whereby an issue is forced into expression. This always results in a considerable amount of stress, strain, and tautness, a a tenseness producing a somewhat destructive condition rather than the free easiness necessary to the free expression of spirit. 2. Denials are another form of dominance by which one wishes forcefully to dispose of some undesirable condition. I say unto you, resist not evil, Jesus. This effort invariably results in mental stress and soon develops into antagonism, which in itself produces an an undesirable condition. Furthermore, it is the thing to which you give attention that you bring to yourself. Denying an undesirable condition is giving it attention. Consequently, by denial, you are giving it place, life, vitality, and making it more real, bringing it closer to yourself rather than disposing of it. 3. Visualization While it has its value and its plane, it does not belong to spiritual healing. It is a form of phenomena and belongs to the second level of mind, the subconscious, while spiritual healing takes place on the third level of mind, the master consciousness. Here you have nothing to do with phenomena, for the spiritual level of mind is freed from the relative world. This is a level of mind Jesus, the greatest of all metaphysicians, worked in when he was teaching and healing, attending to his father's business. Let us endeavor to follow in his footsteps, and we shall be blessed accordingly. The attitude of a true student is to contact a subject for the purpose of studying it and become thoroughly acquainted with it, and in this way determine its value. This I ask of you, study these lessons with an open mind, and you will find a very practical teaching. If followed in the proper spirit, definite results will be your reward. My prayer for you, dear fellow traveler on the pathway of life, is that you might be able to see the gleam of light herein contained and have the strength to follow it. James Dodds The Teachings of the Master's Ministry Mastery, the form of intelligence which serves both God and man. The Power of Thought Thought as a dynamic or health force, thought in its fourth or life dimension. The Christianity of Christ's Time in which there is room for all. Modern metaphysics, based upon doctrines of non-dominance, non-interference, and non-sectarianism. Ever-present guidance, intuitive knowledge of the one best way in any need or given instance. It is always before the mind of tranquil faith. For every one that asks receive, and he that seeketh find, and to him that knock it shall be opened. Matthew 7, 8. The law of life, in its minimum effect, justice, in its fuller effect, love and abundance. I hold that love alone teaches. The masterful way is the easiest way. Simplicity is power. Man attracts his own, whether by love and acceptance or by toil and labor, the choice lies with him. Peace is unto you who accept. 
The greatest work is accomplished by silent thought in the presence of God, when one endeavors to do unto others whatsoever he would have men do unto him, while knowing and believing that thinking is life and that thought is power. The Master has come. He is here indwelling in each. Those know who chose to know. I teach that. You can help others only by their consent. Peace is life. To take another's peace is to take his life. God saves. Man serves. The movement of life is ever onward. Life is teachable. Health, success, and happiness are teachable. All true work is accomplished by the indwelling master. It is man's province to choose, accept, realize, and joyfully serve. There is one God, and that God is good. Mind defined. What is mind? Some authorities claim mind to be the faculty or power whereby thinking creatures feel, think, perceive, desire, and will. But when you come to analyze mind, you find it even more far-reaching than this. Science tells us that there is only one substance in the universe, energy. Energy must then be in all, through all, over all, and under all. Everything must be interpenetrated by this force. Everything must necessarily be directed, related to what is commonly spoken of as a mind. All things, then, must have at least instinctive mind-knowing. This knowing is life, therefore. Everything must be alive and have a knowing of its kind. All things, then, blend into one harmonious whole. However, this force has many forms of expression. Each thing, each person, is an individual expression of the one substance. The individualized expression called man has many parts. There are seven parts of being. 1. The Divine 2. Spirit 3. Ego 4. Soul 5. Magnetic Element 6. Physical Body Each of these parts of being is essential to a human being. The union of these six constitutes the seventh, or mind. To the degree each part is developed and harmoniously related with the other parts, do we have a well-organized or powerful mind. The correct definition, then, is mind is a condition resulting from these harmoniously united essential parts of being. This condition mind may be colored by one's attitude and made an agent for either destruction or construction. You have free choice in this matter. Only you will have to take the life result of your choice, which are a product of your own will. The Three Levels of Mind In psychology, this mind is again divided into three levels, namely, 1. The Common Conscience, 2. The Subconscious, and 3. The Master Mind, or the Master Conscious. Each of these levels is quite distinct. Each one has its own faculties. Each has its own special function and power. Each has its own office to perform. Different authors give different names to these parts. It is necessary for the student to learn these names and to know that these different names mean one and the same thing. For such knowledge will make the already large and confusing literature on the subject a single open book to him. These levels have been numbered. The numbers have no reference to their importance, but these numbers of the levels are in their order in which the average person becomes conscious of their importance. The first level of mind is the ordinary consciousness which we use day by day. It is that part of mind of which we are cognizant, with which we commonly think we use and which we are conscious of using in ordinary states. Various names by which it is known, and which mean one and the same thing are the common consciousness, the conscious mind, the objective mind, the ordinary mind, the waking mind, and the mind of awareness. The second level of mind is that part of the mind which continues activity during sleep. It is that mind which lies just barely below the ordinary consciousness. It operates in dreams. It brings us impulses. It reaches deep down into our being. Generally, one is not familiar with it, but nevertheless, everyone knows that there is such mental activity. The second mind level is called the subconscious mind, the subjective mind the psychic mind, the habit mind, the functional mind, and the suggestional mind, the involuntary mind. These names are all very truly descriptive and refer to this one thing, the one mind division, which lies just beneath our ordinary consciousness. 
The third level of mind is of the real self. It lies closest to the true being. It is really the divine self linked with the lesser self. It is that mental level upon which the human being senses freedom from all limitations, but is fully cognizant of full manhood and womanhood. It makes self known both in simple and exalted forms. Other names by which the third level is known are the subliminal consciousness, the subliminal mind, the superman, the master mind or the master consciousness or the higher self. The terms the knower, the healer, the seer, the impersonal Christ, and the indwelling master refer to it. Any terms indicating this level of mind are almost always capitalized. Terms of this kind will be found in all the Hebrew, Arabic, Hindu, and Chinese writing and all the ancient literature. But the terms always leave one unvarying characteristic. They always refer to that part of man which is a harmonious combination of the human and the divine nature of man. In this level of mind we find the silence. The student should fix these different levels clearly and distinctly in his conception. Mind is a conditioned thing. Thinking or ideation is its motion and thoughts are the product of that motion. I have, prevented, I have presented the above so that you will realize more clearly what I mean by mind and will be able to follow the lessons with great interest and understanding. There is one infinite spirit plus its infinite manifestations. Man is an expression of this infinite spirit and being of it, is it, consciously experiencing itself. There is one music. We know that there are many kinds and forms, yet all are of the one music. It is the same with the spirit, many levels, many degrees of clearness, many different interpretations or manifestations. Yet there is but one spirit. Lesson number one, what the silence is. In order to do silent work, it is necessary to have an outline or general idea of just what is meant by the silence. What is it? Many have been led to believe that the silence can be appealed to, that help can had from the silence. And fully, as many have had been sadly disappointed in finding that their desires have not been realized, that their prayers have not been answered. In consequence of not having accomplished satisfactory results, they have arrived at the place where they have said, metaphysics is a failure. Nothing can be done with it that is worthwhile. Those who are using it are just simply chasing bubbles, in reality accomplishing nothing more than dissipation of their forces and laboring under clouds of delusion and deceit. But this is simply not true. The silence is indeed very real to those who have been able to find it, to those who have been able in consciousness to still the inward strife, and in so doing find themselves resting in peace in harmony with their feet firmly placed upon the solid rock of understanding. Here in this place each one is able to have conscious contact with the spiritual side of life. In reality, the silence is a state of mind, a place in consciousness. It is not something to which you can appeal. It can be best comprehended if you consider it to be a temple, the temple of the Most High, wherein you find God. The temple of itself is not God, but God dwells in this temple. The silence is a state of mind wherein you find that which is eternally new, that which is eternally fresh, fragrant and life-giving. If you were to compare it with soil, you would call it virgin soil. While comparing it to water, it is like a fresh, clear pool wherein you see everything. This state of mind, which is clear, even and clean, is the silence. But as Buddha said, Ask not from the silence, for it cannot speak. Do not expect the silence to answer you. It cannot. It is dumb. The current impression of the word work implies either physical or mental action. Now, silent work implies nothing undesirable, nor is it toil or labor. Instead, it means service through loving contact. This service being unselfish, freely given, brings real joy. You may enter the temple of silence and there do your work. You do your work in the silence. It is not the silence that does the work. All true work is done in the silence. In this temple you meet the healer, the real healer in you. You also meet your patient. You talk to the healer and you talk to your patient in the silence, not to the silence. In order to know the silence, or rather in order to know when you are in the temple, 
It is necessary for you to be very alert to your surrounding and to be able to feel your way consciously as you proceed. After entering, know by your feeling or by your state of consciousness that you really in the silence and not in some other lower level of mind. The state of mind necessary to bring about this state of consciousness is very sweet, a stillness wherein you find perception very clear and very alert to the higher things of life. Here on this plane of consciousness, the silent plane, you cannot think about or associate with anything undesirable. There you can think only in terms of love, in terms of adoration and service. There can be no thought of dominance, no thought of antagonism, no thought of self-aggrandizement. If these latter three enter into your consciousness, they signify that you are not in the silence. You will have no psychic experience in the silence. You will not see visions there. You will not hear voices. You will not feel the touch of the individual. Visualizing and picturing belonging to the subconscious mind, the lower level of mind. In the silence, you will have a very clean-cut, sweet, uplifting spiritual consciousness. Added to this will be a joy, a very definite, satisfying joy. One who has really felt this contact, who has had this spiritual kiss, will always seek and welcome it again. You will never be satisfied with anything other than it, since it is the fundamental state of mind. The silence is indeed very real to those who have found it. They alone can understand and appreciate it. It is necessary for the individual to make a definite effort to seek this higher level of mind in order to have the slightest appreciation of the silence. No one can do it for you. You must do it yourself. You can accomplish it as well as anyone. You are an expression of the divine and carry within your bosom that spark which gives you eternal life. Therefore acquaint yourself with this and endeavor to have conscious communion. Unquestionably you will realize this in the silence. Whatever work you do in this place will be done well, very, very well, because of the high nature of the plane. This is the place of the Immaculate Conception, where you receive the new, where you acquire a state of mind that is virgin, and into it will come truth. Into it will come the light that will not only illuminate your life, but through you the lives of all whom you contact. Let's go over some questions and answers for lesson number one. Question. What is the silence? Answer. The silence is the fundamental state of mind, the one best state. Of all the states of mind, the silence is the most powerful. Question. To what level of mind does the silence belong? Answer. The third level of mind, the master consciousness. Question. To what would you compare this still place called the silence? Answer. A pool of clear water wherein you see all, a rapidly revolving wheel wherein the spokes seem to vanish because of the rapidity of motion. Question. What is the motion of the silence? Answer. Compared to outer world things, stillness. Question. What is always present in the silence? Answer. The master. Question. Should one talk to the silence and expect an answer from the silence? Answer. No, the silence of itself cannot speak. Question. Does one ever find anything unpleasant in the silence? Answer. No, here all is harmony. Question. Is the silence, strictly speaking, conscious of itself? Answer. No. Question. Is there any kind of consciousness in the silence? Answer. Yes, the consciousness of the Master, and in fact, everything you choose to contact has a consciousness, and you can become aware of it in the silence. Question. Is the silence a psychic state? Answer. No, you do not find phenomena in the silence, or in the Master consciousness. All phenomena belongs to mortal mind. Question. What is mortal or carnal mind? Answer. Mortal or carnal mind consists of the untrue of the common consciousness and the subconscious levels of mind. These are the two levels that have to do with form, space, and time. End of lesson one. Lesson number two, concentration. Concentration is the ability pointedly and harmoniously to focus your attention upon the object of your choice. Nothing so engrosses the attention as the free expression of a definite purpose. Universal Law by Walter Scott Hall 
There are three parts or levels of mind. One, the common consciousness. Two, the subconscious. And three, the master consciousness. The latter two are well organized. They are concentrated in the sense that organization is concentration. If the mind is well organized, it can be handled masterfully. However, the one part of the mind that is not concentrated is the common conscious mind, that part of mind which has to do with the ordinary things in life. This mind is often in a state of confusion, wherein one is unable to apply himself pointedly to any definite object for a given time. Pointedness can be accomplished provided one will comply with the law of concentration. It is very simple to apply when one has become thoroughly acquainted with it. All that I ask of my reader is to give this method a fair trial. Then I know he will agree with me that concentration is, after all, very simple. Research informs us that about 200 ideas pass through the average developed mind during a minute. Very well, what would be the result providing you could hold, by attraction, not by force, one thought for half a minute? Do you not see that this would be a thought with power behind it? The value of concentration is to make our thoughts powerful agents for good rather than weak, impotent, unpurposeful thoughts. The fewer thoughts that pass through the mind in a given time, the more powerful will these thoughts be. There has been a great deal written about concentration, but very little on the method or how to bring about this state of mind. Everyone should be able to bring about this state at will, and to do so harmoniously, without stress, strain, or labor, either physical or mental. The greatest stumbling block to those who study concentration is that they allow themselves to become physically tense, taut, extremely positive. Consequently, the channel through which the life force flows is choked, and nervousness and discouragement are the results, the very opposite of the condition desired. Avoid effort. Effort indicates misunderstanding. Concentration becomes false and dangerous when effort is employed. True concentration is achieved with absence of effort and succeeds where effort fails. The word concentration itself suggests drawing together, gathering up, focusing. This often tends, though it need not, to cause stress, labor, and tenseness. So for the purpose of acquiring a state of easiness, let us use conce consecration. This suggests giving up, letting go, freedom, and easiness. Remember, it is the thing with which you do easily that you do well. Simplicity is power, and I want you to acquire this easiness of manner. Give yourself up to this idea. To be at ease is to be powerful. Quietly and slowly, slowing down the action of your mind. No, you can never stop your mind. The action of mind means life to you. So do not try to stop it or to make your mind a blank, because it is impossible to do so and continue to exist. Quoting from First Steps in Concentration by W. Frederick Keeler Things not to do when attempting to concentrate mentally. Do not try to hold your mind. Do not force your mind. Do not try to hold your thoughts or to hold a thought. Do not resent any thought that may come. Do not resist thoughts when they crowd in. These instructions emphasize the fact that we are not to use dominance while dealing with the mind if we wish to accomplish results. The great secret lies in letting the mind have its freedom, letting thoughts come and go, and choosing some one thought and giving it attention, contacting it with love, winning it, rather than trying to force it to stay with you or hating it to make it leave. Let us proceed according to this principle. In order to concentrate, it is necessary to have something to concentrate upon. To start our practice in the silence workshop, let us take peace as the principle upon which to concentrate. The next move is to assume a natural physical posture, one that is natural to you. The best position for a student is a sitting position. This gives the requirement of ease. However, many are faced with the problem of being unable to relax and to be at ease. If you have this difficulty, it is well to make this up right here and to solve it before going any further. By doing so, you will make the most rapid progress. This method is very simple. It is well to remember that simplicity is power. When you sit down and find your body tense, it is a sign that you are mentally tense also. However, we are working with the physical just now. Your body is tense. Very well. Sit up straight in your chair. Place your feet flat upon the floor. 
your hands on your lap, palms up, then mentally choose peace. You have called for peace. You have associated with yourself with peace. Now rest and let go. By doing so, you are offering a receptive attitude toward the object of your choice, peace. Therefore, you are in a position to receive this condition, peace. The next move is to examine yourself to see if you feel a little easier. If so, go over this again. Each time you will find you are becoming more at ease with yourself. You are making headway. Very good. Now get up and do something else. This change will rest your mind. Then turn to it again. This time you will be fresher and more open and your state will be better in a deeper one. However, if you are not able to make this headway and find your body remaining tense, mentally associate yourself with your extremities. Think peace in association with your hands and feet. Go a little farther. Think of each finger in turn and at the same time open and close that finger. In this way you will relax it. Then go over your toes in the same way. Then take your right leg, do the same thing to it, then your left leg. Do the same with your arms, then your shoulders and your back. Finally, you take the whole body into your consciousness and discover that you are relaxed and at ease with yourself. Furthermore, your mind will be relaxed and at ease and you will have a very good foundation on which to build. A relaxed body indicates a concentrated mind. Now lovingly choose peace. When this is done, you are quite sure to find an inflow of ideas that seem to take possession of your mind and shut out the object of your choice, peace. This is just what should happen if you are a beginner, and most of us are. Now let us see what has happened. Why should this flood of ideas come at such a time? Why should it not come? Have you not asked for mental power? Well, here it is, more than you can handle. The river has overflown its bank, and all this power is going to waste. Your next step is to get control of this power. It is a thing which you can give attention to that you bring to yourself. You choose to handle this whirling wheel of mind so that you may be able to contact peace. Do not resist this evidence of power, but merely be an onlooker. Let the ideas come and go. Presently you will find peace as a real state and condition at hand. Now is your chance. Give this idea special attention. Touch it with an attitude of love, and it will stay with you a short time without any extra effort on your part. Why? Because out of all the ideas that are flowing through your mind, this is the only one to which you are giving definite attention. Then let it go. Give it freedom. Ideas want freedom just the same as human beings. To the degree that you have been able to relate with peace and love, just to this degree have you won peace to yourself and it will be on hand to serve you. As this mind wheel turns, you will find that all the other ideas fade away purely from lack of attention, and your chosen idea, peace, will be with you and will stay with you of its own free will. Why? Because you have offered love to it, and even ideas respond to love and remain where it is. Thoughts are living, vibrant things. Winning your way is the powerful way. What you win, you have. Do not allow yourself to remain at this task long at any time or you will spoil all the good work you will have accomplished by making labor of it. The moment you feel you are becoming tired, know that you are trying to force your mind rather than letting it serve you. Read over the things not to do. In order to do good work, it is necessary to remain in a relaxed state of mind. By doing this, you keep the channel open and you have access to unlimited mind power. This is working outline. If this method is applied conscientiously, you will soon master concentration and you will be able to study further the high science of silent work. Questions and answers on lesson two. What is concentration? Answer. Concentration is the ability pointedly and harmoniously to focus your attention on the object of your choice. Question. Name the parts of mind that are in themselves concentrated. Answer, the subconscious and the master conscious. Is it possible to stop the mind? Answer, no, thinking is life, therefore mind action is necessary for one to exist. Question, what is the process carried on while in the act of concentrating? Answer, slowing down the action of the mind, 
thus observing your thoughts and selecting one for loving attention. Question. What is the attitude which makes concentrating easy and pleasing? Answer. Consecration. Question. How is the value of a thought increased? Answer. By giving it loving freedom. Question. How is thinking made more powerful? Answer. By reducing a number of thoughts that pass through the mind in a given time. Question. Under what condition does a law of attraction function? Answer. Loving attention is freedom. Question. In concentrating, what is the mental state necessary to produce and to feel? Answer. Peace. Question. The physical condition? A. Answer. Relaxation. Question. Should one try to hold a thought by force or dominance? Answer. No. Question. Should one try to hold his mind? Answer. No. Give the mind its freedom. Question. Should one resist thoughts as they crowd in? Answer. No. Question. What is your first mental act in concentrating? Answer. Stating silently, I choose to concentrate. Verse. And so I find it well to come, for deeper rest to this still room. For here the habit of the soul feels less the outer world's control. And from the silence multiplied by these still forms on every side, the world that time and sense has known falls off and leaves us God alone. Whittier. End of lesson. Introduction to Lesson 3. There are many states of mind, this fact being fundamental, there must be one state of mind which is the most effective and powerful. This is the silence, the master consciousness. This is the abode of your higher self, of the knower, the healer, the seer, known also as the realm of peace, tranquility, repose, and masterfulness. There you stand, Lord of all you survey. The cultivation of the conscious awareness of and understanding of the state of mind is necessary in order to do silent work, healing, and teaching. This is a plane of consciousness in which Jesus Christ worked when he performed his many wonderful acts of healing and other so-called miracles, which in reality were not miracles but the result of enlightened adjustment to a spiritual law. This will work equally well for you or me, provided we conform to the law, which means learning how to have conscious communion with the Father. This can be attained by seeking the silence as a place of worship, that place in spirit where it is possible to have conscious companionship with the Father, who tells us that if we have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Lesson number three, how to enter the silence. In present this method in detail so that you will have something definite with which to work. The silence is founded upon three cardinal principles. Peace, love, and joy. Peace should be your physical and mental state. Love should be your attitude toward the great healer or God who resides in you and your patient. The result of this conscious contact with God should be joy, definite, subtle joy. Let us take up these principles or steps in consciousness one at a time. What is peace? Is it not a condition of mind brought about by one being at home with oneself? How are we to acquire this state of peace? By eliminating conflict. I know that this accomplishment is a rare jewel worth acquiring. We can do this if we will face ourselves as we are, not as we would like to be, but as we are. Self-analysis is necessary if we wish to remove the undesirable and acquire the desirable. In analyzing yourself, it is necessary to watch not only the desire which brings about certain definite conditions in the manifested world, but it is also necessary to watch what the result of this physical manifestation will produce upon the mind as a reaction and just what your inner state is as a final result to your own first desire. If you find yourself in a state of or in some degree of hate, fear or love, by observing this result you can tell definitely whether the first attitude was a constructive or a destructive one and thus you will know whether or not to entertain it again. Let me elucidate this still further. What is your attitude when you think of fire? Is it fear? If so, you are out of tune with fire. Fear in itself is all right, 
but when you do not handle it according to its law, you get burned. However, this does not condemn fire. To some it suggests warmth, joy, life, freedom. Therefore, it is necessary for you to make it a mental adjustment with fire. Then you will be able to think of it and not be disturbed in the least. When you think of music, no doubt you are thinking in the same direction as life and music. Consequently, no friction exists and you are in tune or a harmonious relationship with music. It is necessary for us to become at home with our thoughts, making them good companions rather than uncongenial ones. The way to learn a language advantageously is to associate with those who speak it fluently, starting to use it at once. You will have to learn the fundamentals, but you will make the greatest headway by using the language. So with this state of mind peace, you must associate with the condition of peace in mind. Your first fundamental step is choice. Remember, it is the thing you choose to give attention to that you bring to yourself. We start by thinking, I choose peace. This, of course, is a positive act of mind. You have asked for peace. You have sent out the call. You have related yourself with peace. You have put forth your thought hands and contacted the principles of peace. The next step is the great divide, where so many dear souls find the road so difficult that they themselves pitifully lacking in ability to go on. Here they tarry like a lion in a trap, crying out and demanding freedom in life, lacking an attitude of receptivity. You cannot be eternally positive. You must alternate your states of mind. You have asked for peace. Offer a receptive attitude toward this object of your choice. Open the door of your consciousness so that this guest may enter. You would not invite your best friend to visit you, and when he arrived, have him find your home locked and you away on a fishing expedition. No, you would be home, and there would be a wonderful atmosphere of welcome, and your guest would immediately feel that atmosphere and be at ease, adding joy and zest to your life. So it is with peace. Open and receive the pearl of great price. Entertain it lovingly. Loving contact is all that is necessary at first. It may go, but it will soon return, and finally you will have it for an abiding guest, a permanent companion. Luke 12.32 Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The first words Jesus uttered when he commenced to teach were, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, further on, he says, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Luke 17.21 This kingdom is not a place but a state of mind, a plane of consciousness, a level of mind wherein one is conscious of the good spell that Jesus talked so much about and masterfully demonstrated the fact that it is possible to attain it now. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom was the great subject of his teaching, but as yet we have not been ready to set aside those outer things and permit ourselves to enjoy this privilege, not having acquired the knowledge or ability to accept this gift of the Most High. If you lack the ability to receive the kingdom, you cannot enjoy this wonderful gift. It is necessary to cultivate a receptive attitude, not a negative one wherein you let down the bars of your mind and let anything enter that may come along, for that is a destructive state. But you have chosen peace. You have directed yourself toward peace. This definite, purposeful act will safeguard you against anything undesirable. Consecrate your thoughts to this business you have chosen to carry out. Consecrate yourself to this act of choosing. Let go of your common world consciousness. Step into this new world. Accept the new birth in your evolution, and you will have new, brighter, and more satisfactory experiences. Your progress depends a great deal on your ability to let go of the world thoughts and for the time being attach yourself wholeheartedly to this new condition, peace. To the degree that you can let go and reattach yourself to this higher state, just to the degree will you get the actual realization of this first step in seeking the silence. This is your foundation, and it is well to be sure of your ground before you attempt to proceed. Quoting Lao Tzu, the great Chinese philosopher. One step taken in the right direction never has to be retaken. When this mental state of peace is established, you can then proceed in perfect safety. The next step is to acquire the loving consciousness. Let me ask a question. 
What do we mean by love? Do you ever stop and meditate upon this? This principle called love has indeed been dragged into the filth and mire of materialism, selfishness, and degeneracy. No wonder that when love is mentioned it brings with it the tainted atmosphere of the lower self. A lie is only the perversion of truth. There must be a truth or there could not be a lie. Truth is positive, a lie is negative, destructive. So there must be a pure, unadulterated, powerful love. It is with this higher, impersonal phase of love I wish to have you become more familiar. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly. Love seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in its inequity, but rejoice in the truth. 1 Corinthians 13.4 True love is indeed a wonderful gift, a gift from God. It is the sign of God's appreciation for our attention, our constant desire to serve Him to live according to his plan, not according to our own selfish desires. This is God's world, and God should run it according to his plan to fulfill his purpose. God's way of working is by love. Quoting Paul again, Love never faileth. Therefore, God must win. This love is therefore the crowning attribute of life. So it behooves us to become well acquainted with the law of love. God is love. Also the healer, the all-knowing one, the seer, the comforter, the helper that the Nazarene told his disciples he would send them when he would be with them no more in the flesh. Love is an attribute of God, so it must be something very desirable. This love is the lifeline that unites man in the physical world to the spiritual world through the channels of soul, mind, and body. When you cultivate love as an attribute, you are at the same time cultivating your soul, the most definite part of your being. In fact, provided your purpose is pure and you are seeking in all sincerity, you will also be developing harmony in a powerful mind. Love is the tie that binds all human hearts together and causes them to melt into one. It is that condition or state of mind that places you in harmony with the object of your choice. It is necessary for you to win your way, not fight your way through life. It is also a law in the silent empire that one must win an audience with the object of his choice rather than force one. This is pure, unselfish love, free from the taint of emotional or sensual desire. With such love, one can approach the silence without any reserve whatsoever and with perfect assurance abandon oneself to the arms of God in the keeping of the Master. True love is perfect in understanding, and perfect understanding gives poise, sweetness, and easiness of manner. So in this state of mind you find yourself perfectly at home with yourself and all your surrounding, it being a natural state of all rightness. Now in this state of love and perfect understanding, all sense and fear of loneliness, all sense of separateness will vanish and you will awaken to the wonderful truth that you are in tune with the universe and all is well, that you are for the time being appropriating this wonderful, regenerating, vivifying life force, and by so doing you will become conscious of the added power, an added breath of consciousness, and a new comprehension of the principles of life. This is indeed a magical state of mind and one in which you are able to do many noble and serviceable acts, a place where you think and build constructive, purposeful thoughts, and thus render a very much needed service to your brother man, namely, to relate your fellow man with this new consciousness and thought, and by so doing, offer him true joy. This is spreading the good news of the kingdom of heaven. True joy does not bring with it any form of exaltation. Exaltation, ecstasy, or any form of excess is a phase of emotionalism. Emotion is the soul in motion. Emotionalism is the soul on a rampage of uncontrolled emotion. It is just as harmful to dissipate your forces while contacting good as it is to dissipate them by contacting the undesirable. Both are a definite waste of valuable energy, energy you have asked for and received. Therefore, keep your poise, appropriate this intelligent life force, and direct it into constructive channels. 
By all means, do not dissipate or waste it, but endeavor to keep your ship of state on a definite course, and plot your course straight for the harbor of constructive service. Having accomplished this, you will appreciate this fact that you are actually in the temple of the silence. Your mental workshop, where you find your thoughts, are your tools, and you are ready to go to work. Questions and answer for Lesson 3. Question. What do you call the one best state of mind? Answer. The silence. Question. Give some religious names for the state. Answer. The inner sanctuary, the temple of the Most High, or the closet. Question. Why should we cultivate the ability to read our feelings? Answer. So that we may be to determine accurately the effects of our thoughts on ourselves. Question. Give one certain way in which to become acquainted with the silence. Answer. By giving it attention, to the degree that you give it loving attention, will you hasten its acquaintance. Question. Of what does the first mental step consist when you wish to enter the silence? Answer. Choosing the silence. Question. What is the first mental state necessary to enter the silence? Answer. Peace. Question. What attitude must one have in order to enter the silence? Answer. An attitude of love. Question. Give another way in which this love serves you. Answer. It makes it possible to contact consciously the great healer, also life, wisdom, and one's individual teacher. Question. Give a common, practical name for the silence. Answer. The workshop. Question. Of what do your tools consist? Answer. Your thoughts. Question. If the silence is a state of mind, what is mind? Answer. Mind is a condition resulting from the united parts of being. End of lesson three. Lesson number four. What is found in the silence? The silence as we understand it is a state of mind. But just considering it as a state of mind is not very definite. I wish to convey to you the potency of this unusual level of consciousness. The silence is a superstate, the state wherein you realize your possibilities and rejoice in the fullness of life. But mind is not merely consciousness as you commonly and familiarly know mind. There are a few people who realize the possibilities of their mind. There are many who limit themselves considerably because of ignorance. The end of slavery freed human bodies. Ignorance, which is slavery of the mind, is worse than physical slavery. An ignorant man today is more of a slave, more to be pitied, than was Epitachus, an actual physical slave. Ignorance causes great limitations. Knowledge brings wisdom and freedom, which is emancipation from a pit of darkness, ignorance. Know thyself, know your mind, and you will know your possibilities. Mind is a coordinated, united activity of spirit, soul, and life action. Mind is a phase of life, a larger and more inclusive, far-reaching thing than one commonly believes. Mind is limitless. Man is limitless. There are no limits placed upon man or mind except those man has put upon himself. There is no limit in spirit, and when you are functioning in the silence, you are functioning on a plane where there are no limitations. Time and space are completely eliminated from the consciousness which is in the silence, the field of activity. You will be functioning on the now plane, which is another name for the silence. There is no other time there than now, the great new time now. Remember, your state of mind is more important than your thoughts because every thought you give birth to will be colored by the state of mind you are in when you create it, when you think it, and give its freedom its expression. If you are in a good state, you will think good thoughts that will build harmoniously and are destined for good rather than destructive purposes. Our object is to recognize our purpose, which is to deal consciously with life facts on the creative plane where all things originate, the causal plane, or the source. Thoughts are products of states of mind. States of mind, then, teach more than things. Many people study things in order to understand them. But if you do not have the right state of mind, you will not learn very rapidly. Therefore, watch your state of mind and cultivate the ability to have you state the wish when you wish it. This is done in a very simple manner. In an attitude of love, choose the state of mind you wish. 
To the degree you are able to put love into your choosing, just to this degree will you succeed. And this chosen state will have in it that which will make it easy for you to understand the thing chosen because the state of mind itself teaches you regarding itself. People do not give sufficient attention to their states of mind and this is a sad mistake. Endeavor to watch this phase of your life and you will profit greatly. Consecration and interest are of more importance to the production of results than the things studied. These are states of mind if you have the proper attitude toward the silence. The silence will teach you all about itself, for the silence is powerful. It is the environment of the great teacher, the indwelling master. You will learn that states of mind can and do teach of themselves. For instance, good results depend more upon the intensity of your interest and your consecration than upon the object or ideal chosen. How you study matters more than what you study. You know what happens to a glass of muddy water when you let it stand for a little while. The earth and the water settles to the bottom, and the water remains clear and pure. Just because the earth was in the water does not condemn the earth. The earth of itself is a necessity of life and is perfectly all right. When it is in its proper place, it is very valuable, but when it gets mixed up in our drinking water, we do not like it, although it is merely out of place. When one gets in the muddy water state in his mental or spiritual world, one has associated things incorrectly. Most people are in this condition and see no immediate relief in sight. Now you will appreciate the value of stillness as the easy natural mental state which clears up your mental and spiritual vision and enables you to perceive clearly the true conception of whatever you contact. This stillness is being in rhythm with life. When one stills his whole being physically, mentally, and spiritually, all things desired flow into it. As light enters, darkness disappears. When you are living a natural, clean, peaceful life, going through life with the gentleness you expect other people to give you, all things desired come into your life. It is the eternal racing on that makes trouble. It is necessary for you to get still to know what it will do for you, to realize what effects it will have in your being. Take time to live. Life is beautiful and means much to you, but if you race through it, you lose all its beauty, all its charms. When you slow down your life, you will have an opportunity really to see, to think, and to live, and give attention to whatever you choose to associate yourself with in such a definite manner that it will remain with you and serve you lovingly. It is in this way that you attract and hold harmoniously the beautiful things of life and experience nothing of the undesirable. Then will your environment, your life, be full and complete. Seek the silence, for it contains your fondest hope. We have been considering things. We understand things better than principles. However, let us go a little farther. In the silence you find all things in the form of principle, rather than in concrete form. Here you contact the original in its essence. As above, so below. Everything has a spiritual counterpart. It is this spiritual aspect of things that we contact in the silence. We choose health. Very well. We cho wish to contact the principle of health. Let us consider some ideas of this principle. God exists as a perfect but incomprehensible being. Before heaven and earth were, is immaterial and immeasurable, invisible and inaudible, is mysterious yet manifest, without shape or form, is supersensitive and hidden from our eyes. One needs not to peep through the windows to see God. God is not there. The farther one goes away from himself, the less he knows. God is in ourselves first of all. This is God unmanifested. But God is also manifest. God is the external foundation of all things, is the universal progenitor of all things, and only capable of being named by means of the work. But he who would gain a knowledge of God's nature and attributes must first set himself free from all earthly desires. Unless he can do that, he shall not be able to penetrate the material veil which interposes between him and God. God is only revealed to those who are free from material desires. He who regulates his action with God will become one with God. God is a source from which all things come into existence and to which all things return. 
and God is the means through whom this takes place. God, being eternal and absolutely free, has no wants or desires, is eternally at rest, but never idle, does not grow old, is omnipresent, immutable, and self-determined, loves all things, but does not act as a ruler. Because God creates, preserves, nourishes, and protects all things, God is glorified for this beneficence and held in high honor. You will notice that all this is about being and not being. The most profound subject we can discuss. God is both the beyond and the present. Again, God is the foundation of the highest morality. God alone bestows and makes perfect gives peace and is universal refuge, the good man's treasure, the bad man's deliverer and partner of guilt. Here again is God in a new aspect, in the aspect of the moral power of the world or as the judge and savior. From the Inner Life by C.H.A. Burgegaard. Therefore the principle of health is a manifestation of God expressing his health. So with everything else, you contact the principle of it in the silence. You also contact the Father of all principles, God. God is the center around which you revolve and to whom you look for all things. You contact God first and your lesser principles next, and it is necessary for you to contact God first pointedly before you will be able to have conscious contact with a lesser principle, the object of your choice, whatever it may be. After contacting this lesser principle consciously, you offer it to your patient. You exhibit it before the one to be blessed and encourage him to accept it. Do not affirm, deny, or picture. Just offer the chosen principle lovingly to your patient, and the results will be gratifying. If you find yourself affirming or visualizing, know by these signs that you have lost contact with the spiritual level of mind. You are out of the temple of the silence and have dropped into the lower level of mind. You may have had contact with a higher level, but you have lost it, and you are functioning on the force plane, the subconscious. I teach that you should encourage your patient to accept the object of his choice rather than forcing it upon him. Encourage the patient to give up the undesirable and accept the desirable. This is spiritual healing, and to the degree that you allow the great healer to do the healing, it will be done harmoniously and well. Your part is to bring a union of the patient and the object of his choice in the name of the master and let the master do the work. The master will give the patient the ability to receive, appropriate, and express. God always does his part well. Let him do it by doing your part and letting God do his. When you realize the fact that the principles of all things is found here, you will readily see the possibilities. You can contact what you will and learn of it. The principle will teach you and influence you to the extent that you will be quite familiar with it. Another point, know that it is not the silence teaching you, but the things you contact there. The silence is the great silent university which we attend, and the indwelling master is the president, and the lesser principles, the professor and the tutors, but you must receive permission from the president before you may enter the professor's class for the purpose of studying. Let me give you a little more light on the indwelling master, also known as the Christ, the healer, the knower, the seer, and the comforter. Jesus continually spoke of God as his Father and spoke of himself as a Son of God, an offspring of the Father. This Son of God is the Christ, and is the same in all men, only some people have a fuller, more natural expression of it. These are great souls, such as Jesus and Buddha. However, these great souls have physical bodies through which to express on this plane. This part of their being is called the Son of Man. Jesus often spoke of himself as the Son of Man, but this Son of Man can, if he chooses, contact and associate in consciousness with the Christ, who is the Son of God, who lives in the Son of Man, and this Christ has access to the Father at all times. We in the physical body have access to Christ, and the indwelling Christ has access to the Father at all times. Questions and Answers Question. What is our aim as metaphysicians? Answer. To deal consciously and masterfully with life. Question. What is a metaphysician? 
Answer, a metaphysician is one skilled in metaphysics. Question, well, what is metaphysics? Answer, the systematic study of the first principles of being and of knowledge. Question, what is modern metaphysician? Answer, one who believes and practices and applies this science to everyday problems, which is of most importance, your state of mind or your thought. What is the value of stillness? Answer, when one stills the mind, all things, the being, desired flow, self into it. Question, what are the most important things found in the silence? Answer, the master, the healer, your patient's higher self, also the principle of everything you wish to contact, also the one great principle which governs all other principles, God. Question, what do we mean by principle? Answer, the original which is pure, natural, unadulterated, the spiritual part. Question, should one ever allow oneself to go to sleep in the silence? Answer, not unless this is your object in going into the silence. This is the only time you should allow yourself to go to sleep while in the silence. Question, should one set a definite time to do silent work? Answer, it is all right to set a definite time while you are studying it. As the subjective mind will aid you, you need its help and need its training. However, do not limit yourself to set times. You should develop the ability to enter the silence at will. End of lesson four. Lesson number five, how to work in the silence. How to give a treatment. The first step in silent work is to realize the majesty of your choice. To do this, is it necessary for you to realize the limitlessness of spirit and that you are functioning in the spiritual level of mind or master consciousness? Mind being limitless, both in scope and power, you can by conscious choice reach out with your thought hands and lovingly caress and appropriate the object of your choice, whatever it may be. This may appear selfish, but there is nothing selfish in spirit. So the objects of your choice must be contacted and immediately set free. If when you make contact, your attitude was one of love, adoration, and appreciation, you will soon find the object of your choice seeking you, and eventually you will have the realization of it. Do not allow any thought or attitude of greed, selfish grasping, or dominance to enter. If you find these elements in your thought, know that you have wandered out of the temple. This jewel is indeed elusive and responds only to free, loving attachment. No degree of force will hold it. It is a transient as a rainbow which must be appreciated while it is present. Do not fail to give the strictest attention of your attitude without allowing any form of stress or anxiety to enter. A quiet, subtle alertness. This is essential if you wish to do good work. Now that you have an appreciation of your new power, let us see what else we find in the Temple of the Silence. Here you become conscious of your higher self, the indwelling Christ, the healer, and of your patient's higher self and your opportunity and ability to serve. Thus you proceed. After becoming aware of your surrounding and realizing that you are in actuality in the presence of the great healer, God, and while permeated with this consciousness of power and understanding, you receive the inspiration to serve. Now you must make a definite choice. What are you going to choose? Whom are you going to serve? God? Yes, of course. Also the patient or yourself. For the purpose of this lesson, let us take a patient by the name of Thomas. In this state of power, you wish to serve Thomas, and your first step is to offer an attitude of love to Thomas. So you relate yourself with Thomas by mentally saying, I love you, Thomas. By doing this, you have contacted him in thought. And if your attitude is one of loving service, you will have won your way to Thomas. And Thomas will be ready and willing to listen to you and accept what you have to offer. One point I wish you to remember here is that on this silent plane of life, you are known for just what you are. Here you stand stripped of all artificial, false, deceptive, or camouflage states. You are recognized by what you are, not by what you would like to be or what you think you are. Spirit does not lie, and no lie can be expressed in spirit. So only the attitude of sincere desire to render unselfish service will be your passport to this temple of opportunity. 
If your attitude is tainted with selfish motives or any form of dominance, you will not be able to gain an audience with your patient, as you are confronted by a law of nature that never fails, and that is the law of self-preservation. The law of self-preservation will not allow you to enter your patient's consciousness with any other motive than that of helping him to carry out his higher plan of life. You have no more right to domineer a person silently than you have to do so orally. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Matthew 7.11 Who knows best for another? Who wishes to be compelled to do something he feels and knows is not best for him? And I say, the patient's higher self knows what is best for him, although it may not be able to carry it out. No, this is your opportunity to serve. You may think you know best for your patient, but this is only thinking and very poor thinking at best. Did it ever occur to you that if you were to leave your dinner cooking while you went out to tell your neighbor how she should cook her dinner, that you would, on returning home, find your dinner spoiled by too much fire? Yes, if we attend to our own affairs, we will have plenty to do without trying to put our neighbor straight. Meddling is not a Christian duty. Meddling is of the devil. All that God asks of us is love. So let us enter into the spirit of love and lovingly offer our services to our patients. So, having won your way to Thomas, you wish to find out in just what way you can assist him to carry out his plan. In this attitude of service, you ask Thomas what you may do for him. How may I serve you? Having asked this question, you offer a receptive attitude to Thomas. Then watch your feelings. How do you feel? Do you get a sense of fear? Do you wish to draw back? Do you seem to shrink? Do you feel timid, excited, or any way disturbed? Fear on this plane is not fear as we know it, but a masterful indifference to life in the physical. Dr. W. K. Keeler If so, Know by this that you have been told what the obstacle is that stands between Thomas and his freedom. Most patients emanate a degree of fear, and you'll soon be able to measure this degree quite accurately. You have registered fear in some degree. Your next move is to turn in thought to your source, the healer in you, and realize you are at atonement with life, and in this conscious approach, Thomas and offer the state of calm, definite power to him. Thomas, I offer you strength, love, and freedom. Then wait, let him take it or not. He has the right to decide. Do not try to force the issue. If you have really won your way to him and have offered this help in the spirit of loving service, you have done your part. Now relax and let go. Start all over again. This will be refreshing and you will make better headway. Then offer love and encouragement to Thomas again. This time you find that Thomas accepts your help. You get a feeling of warmth, of good, all rightness. Know by this sign that you have really reached your patient and that you have been able to serve him. Do not try to work hard at it. If you do, you will very likely spoil the good work already done. Be content with having done this much and happily proceed to thank God for the privilege of serving your brother in such a noble manner. And also thank Thomas for allowing you to enter into a secret chamber of need to serve him. Now that you have had this experience, hold it secret and reveal your findings to no one. In fact, the sooner you can let Thomas and his conditions pass out of your mind, the better it is for you and for Thomas, for any rehashing of the case only tends to offset the good effect of your work. Make the cutoff clean and turn your attention to other business. In order that you may do good work, it is necessary that you realize the oneness of life. We are harmonious units of life and not antagonistic units, as men of the world would have us believe. You are in harmony with the universe and all therein contained just to the degree that you choose to be. Unfortunately, many believe all the world is against them and they must fight for their existence. This is a gross mistake. Life is sweet indeed to those who will adjust themselves to it and endeavor to move with rather than against it. You are thinking against it when you feel that you must fight your way through life. So with healing you must realize that all life is ready and willing to serve you and to help you, that all you have to do is to open to life and to receive it. This we call making an adjustment with life, and that is what you are doing for your patient. Questions and answer for Lesson 5 Question 
Name the fundamental principle one must realize in order to do silent work. A. One mu one's majesty of choice. 2. Mind is limitless. 3. Spirit is immediate and limitless. And 4. You can contact with your thought hands whatever you choose. Question. Why is it easier to help another than it is to help oneself? Answer. In treating oneself, one is prone to become over-anxious, selfish, and grasping. This produces a closed-up condition, and one is unable to receive while in this state. Question. What should one's attitude be towards the silence, and what is found there? Answer. Loving attention, adoration, and reverence. Question. How can you tell when you have reached your patient? Answer. By the feeling you receive, you learn to read this. Question. How can one tell whether or not he has been in the silence? Answer. By ascertaining the feeling he has on quitting his silent work. If he has been in the silence, he will feel better. He will feel a definite satisfaction and a real upliftment. Question. What is the one thing or principle you as a metaphysician deal with? Answer. Life. Question. How long should one stay in the silence? Answer. As long as one can remain inwardly alert and outwardly at ease, free from any form of anxiety. Question. Should one ever try to make another do something definite while in the silence? Answer. No. Because you cannot hold a dominating thought and remain in the silence, and the motive is far from the purpose of metaphysics, your purpose is service. Question. What action by the patient is necessary to order for you to be able to help him? Answer. The patient must give consent on the inner or outer plane, and more especially on the inner. Question. How do you proceed to get this consent? Answer. By contacting your patient with a sincere attitude of loving service. In this way you win your way to your patient, gaining his confidence. Question. Is it possible for another willfully to interfere with your life on the silent plane or to discount a treatment? Answer. No. If you are an awakened soul and realize that you are a king of your domain, no one will be able to influence you for anything other than your eternal good. However, you may give consent, and that will happen and is often done unconsciously by becoming afraid of a certain individual, a certain group of people, a thought, or a condition. If this is the case, you have surrendered to the enemy and have lost for the time being your kingship, your freedom, and have become subject to the condition of which you are afraid. An awakened soul is fearless. This is so because he is one with the Father, and being one with the Father, he is under the protection of the Father, the Good Shepherd, and no harm can come to him. He stands master of life rather than the slave of life. This is your birthright. Those who have and enjoy this freedom who choose to have it, choose, accept, and have the realization of this blessed freedom now. Remember, destructive acceptance is fear. Constructive acceptance is choice, and choice is ever with you. End of chapter. Lesson number six. Indications of the silence and indications that are not of the silence. A general review. The purpose of this lesson is to acquaint you in a more definite way with those states of mind which you are most sure to attract while endeavoring to enter the silence, in order that you may differentiate between them and recognize each at its own true value. In order to do this, I will draw your attention to three levels of mind known as the common consciousness, the subconscious, and the master consciousness. These three levels, as you know, have distinct functions. The common conscious level of mind is that part of your mind which has to do with the ordinary things of life, the part of your mind that deals with the seen world. The subconscious is, as you know, that part of your mind lying directly back of the common level of mind and is known as the second level of mind. This part of your mind is the only part of that being that holds disease. It is the habit mind, the memory mind. The untrue of the conscious and subconscious constitutes what is known as carnal or mortal man. The third level of mind is the master consciousness, and it is on this level that you work as a metaphysician, and with which you naturally become more definitely acquainted. The silence, as you have already discovered, belongs to this level of mind, but it is only one place or state in it. There are other things for you to know. How does this level of mind work, and what is its office? 
every movement of the master consciousness is in the direction of totalization, unity, never separateness or division. These latter two are faculties of the subconscious. The master consciousness knows and has to do only with good or truth. Its conviction and always encouraging, uplifting, refreshing, inspiring, in a word, upward. Its operation may be known as the eternal common sense, not that so-called common sense which changes the fashion of the times, but that peculiar kind that is eternally wise to follow, and to which so few of us wish to give much attention, let alone follow its guidance. This level of mind in operation always demonstrates, one, the ability to do good, two, effectively and constructively by harmonious means and to recognize good the outcome. It will be noted that mere efficiency is not necessarily mastery. Dominance has no part in its effectiveness. Some elements which are always present in the movement of the master mind. Easiness, deliberation, gentleness, considerateness, moderation, individuality, that is, your own thinking. In order to distinguish between the subjective or subconscious mind and the master mind, the following list of faculties are compared. The subconscious mind, time. Master mind, eternity. Subconscious mind, dominance. Master mind, gentleness. Subconscious mind, never original. Master mind, always original. Subconscious mind, separateness. Master mind, unitiveness. Subconscious mind, reason. Master mind, at one moment. Subconscious, analysis. Master mind, synthesis. Subconscious, repetition. Master mind, initiative. Subconscious mind, relative truth. Master mind, the absolute truth. Subconscious mind, personal judgment. Master mind, impersonal love. Subconscious mind unites all in judgment. Master mind unites all in goodness. Subconscious mind knows good and evil. Master mind knows only good. The subconscious mind holds disease. The master mind cures disease. The subconscious mind conclusion. The master mind conviction. Subconscious mind knowledge. The master mind wisdom. The subconscious mind, its faculties are opposite to those of the common conscious mind. The master mind, its faculties unite with those of the common conscious mind. The subconscious mind reached through psychological skill and mentation. Master mind reached through love, spirit, and devotion. The following conditions of mental state invariably indicate the presence of the master mind. Peace, at ease with oneself untroubled conscience, a thrill of the new, assurance, a degree of satisfaction, upward, onward urge, joy. Life on earth or mortal existence is one thing, and being the true life is another. Real being which is, has been variously called the higher life, the true life, also reality in the higher thought literature of the ages. It has always been distinguished from the daily, worldly, or mortal life. The true life is the spiritual life. The so-called natural life, or worldly, is not in reality that natural life. The harmonious, spiritual, is the natural life. In order to deal with this question, it is necessary to know that these two phases of life are not opposed to each other. The past mistake has been that those seeking the true life were often inclined to fight the worldly life. The new age of mastery seeks to unite the two phases of existence to harmonize them. It is no longer a question as to which life or what life to live. Live all life, for all life is sacred. We are all pilgrims. All seek the best and the true life. All will attain it. Some will walk a shorter, more direct, and more pleasant path than others. If you believe it necessary to fight and sacrifice and struggle, very well, your pathway toward attainment will be one of struggle. You are master of it all. It is a matter of choice. But you will never attain until you become conscious of the rose path, until you believe that God is good, and the way to God is sweet and easy. 
Then all life will be sweet and easy. Your daily life or spiritual life will be happy. All talk about spiritual struggles is nonsense. There never was a spiritual struggle. The spiritual life is a life of joy. If your mortal or world mind is determined to struggle about it, very well. But the spirit in you never struggles. Whoever heard of a master fighting or toiling? A master quietly and sweetly conquers by consenting that spirit overcomes for him. It is all a matter of mental adjustment of giving this consent to the indwelling master that he may live your life, solve your problems, and lead you. Life, the outer world life, is a game. Nothing more, nothing less. Play that game as you will. Play it strenuously, play it toilsome and hard, or enjoy it sweetly. Your life is your game. The masterful life is always sweet, for the master within you has faith in the good, the universe, and the great life. Therefore, does not try to usurp it and assume troubles. God is in his heaven, which is also on earth. Let your lesser self be not so conceited. Let go, brother, all is well. Earth life has been called an illusion. It is, but an illusion is not an hallucination. An illusion is not all unreal. An illusion is a reflection of truth. It is always based upon truth. Mortal life is a reflection of the true life. That which you see in the mirror is an illusion. It correctly reflects your face, yet it is not your face. Your daily use, that illusion, that reflection in the mirror for practical and useful purposes, it serves you, yet it is an illusion. It correctly portrays, for it is a useful illusion, such as mortal life. It correctly reflects the real life, but this is not the real life. If there is a blemish in the mirror, the blemish will destroy and distort the picture shown in the mirror. If there is a blemish in your mortal or lesser mind, the true self and the true life will show as though blemished. You should not believe in blemishes, and you do not believe in them, nor do you make use of them. All undesirable conditions of so-called evil that you see are but blemishes coming out of your mortal mind distortion. They are merely illusory, but are negative faults, and are not to be read either into yourself, your earth life, nor the true life. You do not want undesirable conditions. Well, let them alone. Stop fearing them. Cease looking upon them. Busy yourself with the true picture of life. Meditate upon it. Choose it. Open your mind to it. Rid yourself of the false habit of accepting the undesirable as in any way or at any time necessary for you. Know that undesirable experience was not good for you. True, you learn by it. You say, it was awful, but I learned much through it. But why learn in that manner? As long as you allow yourself to be taught by troubles, of course, troubles will teach you for such is your choice. But when you cease believing in troubles and cease praising them and come to believe that love and beauty can teach you best, then the higher and joyous way will teach you, but not before you are the master. You make your life day by day what you mentally choose, and by what you accept in a word, by that in which you believe. The first business in life is to clean and purify one's belief, train yourself, re-educate yourself to really believe in a living and loving God. Daily life, or world life, is, I repeat, a game. You are master. Somewhere in the great eternity you chose this life. You chose your life as it is to be as it is. Therefore, you can remake it exactly as you wish it to be. That is, you can choose what it shall be in the higher forces of nature and spirit will make it unto that which you choose. Why did you consciously or unconsciously, somewhere in eternity, and in the place of your high will, make this game, this illusion, what we call world life, and then come into it? You made it in order that you could feel and experience the fiber of your soul, so that you could feel and better know the master in you. You like the thrill of overcoming. That is why you play the game. Why do men take a perfectly smooth lawn and make bunkers and obstacles upon it, then after making these obstacles try to club little balls around it? It is because they like this game of golf. In playing it, they do not recognize the obstacle as troubled. They do not really fear these things. They love to overcome them. They like to learn to overcome because of the joy of winning that arises within. Out of the absolute freedom you made this illusion. Out of the things of true existence you brought this daily life. 
You made it to try your mental muscles because you like the feeling of overcoming. You made it, therefore you need not fear it. Each condition that arises in it you can overcome. The fact of its arising before you is the pledge of your power to overcome it. You do not even have to overcome it. You can at any time lay down your club of mortal mind and return in consciousness to spirit, while the master in you will restore all to peace and purity, and the outer life need no longer concern you. This does not mean to relinquish living on this earthly plane. The higher and true life of happiness can just as easily be lived on earth as elsewhere. It is always at hand and is simply to be accepted. Do not allow the game of daily life to overcome you. Do not ever fear it. The Master is always within and will show you the truth at any time. Mentally attach yourself to Him. Detach yourself from the illusory game. See things as incidental. Above all, learn to live in the true life by giving it first place in your aims and in your thoughts. Live your daily life as you will, but subject to the true life. Keep your mind still. Be concerned only in the life of the living God. There is but one power, and that is good. Be still or peaceful within, and your mind mirror will be clear and will clearly reflect the real. Make the true life your silent aim, and your good will take care of you. Unite these two phases of life and consciousness. Let this be your conscious mental practice. This is the true function of consciousness. Detach yourself mentally from seeing things as things of cause. Attach yourself to the real life of peace as first cause, the true mental dwelling place. Then you will masterfully say to the world, None of these things move me. Then the indwelling master will always move you to good. Solve your problems silently. Take them silently to the knower. The self cannot do it. Allow the higher self its opportunity. You must consent in consciousness. You are master. If you can do nothing else, be still. Stillness is the motion of spirit, vast and secure. Return to spirit. You cannot be lost, nor can anything be lost to you there. Questions for Lesson 6 Question. Name the levels of mind that constitute mortal mind of man. Answer. The common consciousness and the subconscious. Question. Name the one part of your being that holds disease. Answer. The subconscious mind. Question. What level of mind do you use as a metaphysician work in? Answer. The master consciousness or the third level of mind. Question. What is the chief faculty of the master consciousness? Answer. To totalize, to unify, to bring about the state of harmony. Question. Will the master consciousness have anything to do with the undesirable? Answer. No, this level of mind deals only with truth and beauty. Question. What influence will this level of mind have upon you when you contact it? Answer. Its influence is always encouraging, uplifting, refreshing, and inspiring. Question. Name some of the elements present in the movement of the master mind. Answer. Easiness, considerateness, individuality, moderation, and gentleness. Question. The subconscious mind and the master mind being opposite in their faculties, I should like to have you name some of their opposites, listing them under their respective headings. Give four for each most important. Answer. The subconscious mind. Separateness. The master mind. Unitiveness. Subconscious mind, relative truth. The master mind, absolute truth. Subconscious mind, personal judgment. The master mind, impersonal love. The subconscious mind holds disease, and the master mind cures disease. Question. Name several states or conditions of mind that indicate the presence of the master consciousness. Answer. Peace. At ease with oneself. Untroubled conscience. A thrill of the new. Upward, onward urge. A degree of satisfaction and joy. Question. Are the higher and lower natures of man, in the true sense of them, actually opposed to each other? Answer. No, it only appears so. In reality they are one. But mortal man, in his sleeping state, is not conscious of the reality of things. Only the awakened man can perceive such a state at atonement. Question. Is it necessary to struggle? No. Struggle belongs only to those who believe in it. 
The awakened man knows love and therefore wins his way rather than fights it. Question. To whom does a life abundant belong? Answer. To all those who will accept it. These questions are asked because if a mind is capable of formulating a question, it must also contain the answer. You have access to this level of mind and should develop this faculty of going there for your answers. End of lesson. End of book. This audio presentation on six lessons on the silence by James E. Dodge has been brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2013. All rights reserved.